Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. The war on drugs always seemed like a phony war to me. Instead of defending our borders against the invasion of the drug-dealing body snatchers, our security forces are usually too busy invading other people's countries. Far from beefing up customs and coast guards, successive governments have instead been reducing the labor force. Almost nobody gets pulled at the Green Channel at airports, as I can testify from this very morning, when hundreds of people went through Gatwick Airport with me, with not a customs officer, or more importantly, a dog, in sight. And people deal openly in places we all know, including our very own block. Some people's response to the clearly failing war on drugs is to run up the white flag and give it up. Others, like our first guest, go for a radical change of strategy. We'll find out what that could look like now with Neil Woods, who was 14 years an undercover police officer posing as an addict. He's written a new book called Good Cop, Bad War, and he joins us now. Neil, thanks for coming on the Sputnik. It's a remarkable story. In a nutshell, what did you do for 14 years? Well, um... I would pose uh, sometimes as an addict, as you say, sometimes as a sort of mid-level scally, a travelling criminal. And basically, my targets were the sort of middle management gangsters who would run uh, the sort of regional supply of crack cocaine and heroin, generally in inner city areas. But in order to do that, I would manipulate problematic heroin users and sort of move amongst their sort of communities. And so... Over time, uh, I realised, I mean, I realised very early on that the war on drugs in its current form is a ridiculous concept, something that we, we couldn't win. But for every year that I did the work, and I would sort of, sort of have six months of the time deployments in different cities, for the time that I did the work, each year it gets harder and harder because as the police increase their tactics and get more sophisticated in their tactics, there is a natural pushback from organised crime, from the gangsters that I was trying to catch. And the biggest weapon in their arsenal, of course, is violence and intimidation. And so the most successful gangsters and the most successful organised crime groups are the ones that can most completely intimidate entire communities. And so eventually I realised that the reason that gangsters and organised crime was getting more violent was in a direct response to me, or rather people like me in the, the development of police tactics. And, the, and that there is an inevitability to that. You know, in any unregulated market, monopolies appear. Yeah. And this is the most lucrative unregulated market in the world. So in order to take away the power of organised crime, we need to get drugs under control and regulate them. Well, we'll come back to that. I've just literally gotten off a plane from Canada, Vancouver, one of the world's loveliest cities, beautiful setting, British Columbia. Uh, it has an image. Downtown, in other words, in the centre of Vancouver, is a district which is literally swarming. You can't see... The, the pavement, the sidewalk for derelict people, devastated by drugs, all gathered in one area where presumably some kind of regulation is going on in the sense that they're getting needles, getting at least alternative supplies. They're not actually heroin or even crack addicts mainly. It's a drug I'd never heard of called, is it fretanol? Uh, fentanyl. Yeah, fentanyl. Mm which devastates hundreds of people, kills them, hundreds of people every year in Vancouver. Um, 
So what are we going to do about this? Well, fentanyl is an interesting one. It, it's, it is heroin addicts that use fentanyl because is it, it? Is a, it is an opioid. It's just a particularly strong opioid. And the criminal markets are latching onto fentanyl because it's quite... It's um, in terms of its volume, it but can it's be more it, portable. It's more portable. That's it's what quite the useful. Told me there, yeah. yeah, so it's very useful for them to do. But Canada is an interesting, um, particularly Vancouver is a very interesting city to compare the situation with the UK because um, in Vancouver they have this organisation called Insight where people have safe safe injection rooms, so people can go and they can use their drugs safely and they're not they're not dying they can receive health care and to date no one has died of an overdose in a drug in a, in a safe injection site and so the deaths from drugs in canada has been dropping dramatically the amount of health care addicts get in canada is increasing and if you compare that with the uk we've had three years running of record deaths so things are not going right here and actually the situation in the politics in canada is a very good place to look to for how to improve things. The Canadian government has just approved uh, prescribing heroin in the first instance to mm. people who need it. That's why I raise it. Uh, if that's the kind of regulation you mean, that is running up the white flag, isn't it? Because people who are already hooked are just going to find it more easy and safe to be hooked. Yeah, the, the great danger in drug policy is to judge people. and. If, for, to decide that someone else has to get off their drug, mm. that sort of detect, dictates what policy you're going to take. Every problematic heroin user that I manipulated, and I did manipulate people, I put them in more danger, I made their lives worse. All of those people, the prostitutes, the people who relied on stealing for their, for their lives, they are being manipulated by organised crime. They are being used by gangsters. They could be rescued from that life by prescribing them heroin in the first instance. And then, should they choose to, to seek treatment, then they could be provided treatment in a safe environment. Well, I, I must say I disagree with you profoundly. Uh, I do judge people uh, who are addicted to drugs that are going to kill them, destroy the circle around them, uh, corrode and eat away at the wider society. I make a judgment on that. And I think the state needs to make a judgment on that. What your proposal is effectively that the state becomes the dealer. Are you saying that if there's no demand for the criminals, their, their, their activities would decrease? Or? Uh, what I'm saying is there is evidence that punitive measures don't impact on demand. That's a different matter, yeah. That's a practical so, point, yeah. So, but to get to the point about the government being the dealer rather than organised crime, well, in the, to start with, I would say that it is better for the government to be the dealer and organised crime gangs, because well, we want we why want not to set up brothels and right. it can be the pimp as well. Let, let's let's tackle the fact that, that you you judge those people because most people do morally judge people mm. who have become addicted to heroin. Now, most of the people that I I came across were broken people who were self medicating for something. One particular person whose street name was Uma, in Northampton, and she said, "I can come off heroin, and I do sometimes." But when I do, I become suicidal, so I, so I stay on it. Mm. And the reason that she becomes suicidal is because the memory of the sexual abuse that she received as a child was too much for her to cope with. Now, any drug counsellor will tell you that around two-thirds of problematic heroin users are self-medicating for either childhood physical or sexual abuse. Mm. So to criminalise people who essentially need help is not only counterproductive, it's cruel. Well, I'm not saying criminalise them. I'm saying criminalise the people who are selling them. Let me turn to that. I, I sat in Parliament for almost 30 years, heard all the rhetoric about the war on drugs, but I, I never actually felt there was a war going on. Do you, do you share that? I mean, the effort, certainly to protect our borders, is pitiful. The action that you can take in policing or with borders, or, or any aspect of the attempts to control drugs with, with the me mechanics of the state and policing, are doomed to failure. The demand is too high. I mean, compare it with normal crimes, because drugs, drugs as a policing issue really does stand out. Compare it, for example, with burglary. Any police inspector or detective sergeant in this country knows that you can catch two burglars 
and you can reduce the crime in a town or maybe even half a county. You can reduce those burglaries by catching those people because by catching those, to a degree, you're reducing the demand. It's a very small number of people committing those things. But policing cannot impact on the demand in society for drugs. And the punitive measures do not put people off. You know, people are not this rational actor that make a decision about drug taking that they may get into trouble. It just doesn't happen. No, not the addicts, but the businessmen or gangsters, sometimes well, interchangeable. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean, there they, are user, there are user they, dealers. They're going to be affected by two things, the likelihood of being caught and the punishment if and when they are caught. Mm. That's ABC of policing, isn't it? Um, it would seem the intuitive view to take, but actually the amount of money that's involved in the drug supply, it doesn't put anybody off at all. Bear in mind, I spent a long time working very hard in the front line of the, mm. in the war on drugs. Oh, and I acknowledge I've, that. And, yeah. I, and, I've, and, I've, and I've put people away for a... And, and a you sacrificed uh, some of your health. You, you were damaged by the experience, am I right? I, yeah, but I've come out the other side of that health, healthier than ever. Um, but, you know, I put people in prison for over a thousand years and I caught some really nasty, nasty gangsters. But as police intelligence shows, I only ever interrupted the drug supply in each city for around two hours. There is always someone going to step up. Now, OK, I, I understand that the people's reaction is to say, well, that doesn't mean we should give up. Yeah. But it, as is the case with many wars, the only way to truly win is to declare peace. Because this, this is a, a this is an arms race. There's no chance of de-escalation in this war. When, when, I, when I say that organised crime gets more and more vicious in response to policing, I'm not exaggerating. Is there, and is there's no limit to where that can go. I'm going to read your book because it looks like uh, I need to be challenged on <laughs> my point of view. But if you'd taken that walk down Hastings with me in downtown Vancouver yesterday and seen the pavements black with devastated, derelict people, I don't think you'd be quite so keen to suggest it as a model. Neil, it's a fascinating discussion, and I look forward to reading the book, and I hope many other people do also. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Coming up next, 15 years on, we talk to the founding chairman of the Stop the War Coalition and leading British trade unionist Andrew Murray. <laughs> Welcome back to Sputnik. Fifteen years ago, a small group of people, of whom I was one, knew that 9-11 was a harbinger of great storms to come and formed the Stop the War Coalition, the largest mass movement in British history. Its founding chairman was one of the leaders of Britain's largest trade union, Unite, and but for a brief interregnum, when the chairmanship passed to Jeremy Corbyn before he had to hand it back, having been elected leader of the Labour Party, Andrew Murray has been the chairman for almost all the time since, and he joins us now. Andrew, George. the conference uh, today uh, is looking back at that 15 years. What are your main reflections yourself? Well, the main reflection is it's tragic. We still have to have a Stop the War coalition after 15 years, that the war on terror, which we were united to oppose in 2001, is still continuing, is still causing devastation across so much of the planet. So while it is important to look back, and of course there are many inspiring memories from those 15 years, uh, we also have to look ahead to the very near future, where we still have to bring this war on terror to an end and oppose the really growing danger of even bigger conflicts, superpower conflicts around Syria, the Ukraine, uh, and so on. So unfortunately, uh, Britain still needs a strong uh, mass anti-war campaigning movement, uh, and I think the conference will be as much focused on that as it will be on uh, on reflecting on what has uh, has been an extraordinary history over the last. Yes, years. it's not that any of the conflicts 15 years ago have ended. No. The battles in Afghanistan now involve Al Qaeda fighting ISIS for power uh, when the foreign armies finally uh, leave uh, in Syria and in the Ukraine. We'll come to them. Uh, there are flashpoints that could uh, produce wars that, are, that dwarf the wars we've already seen. But let me run this past you. I'm actually quite surprised. Uh, the Bourbons, it was said, uh, learned nothing and forgot nothing. Our leaders, 
and our fourth estate, our media, appears to be like the Bourbons. They don't have any, there's no sense, a scintilla of reflection or self-reproach or self-criticism. They're saying the same things and proposing to do the same things that were so disastrous last time around. Well, it's even a bit more bizarre than that from one point of view. They embark on a war. It's then in due course acknowledged to be a disaster. We had the Chilcot report about Iraq. More recently, we've had the Collins Select Committee report on Libya saying it's a disaster. And everyone then acknowledges that was a disaster, or more or less everyone acknowledges that was a disaster. And then they go on to uh, another one. They are impelled to carry on trying to impose their will on countries that don't want to have the will of Britain and the USA imposed on them. Uh, they, it always ends in disaster. You're absolutely right. Not only has the war been going on for 15 years in aggregate, not a single aspect of that war has ever come to an end, whether it's Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Yemen, of course, now uh, as well. So there is a blindness. And even though they say from time to time, oh, we got that one wrong, it doesn't lead to enough pause for thought before they embark on the next conflict. And meanwhile, the effects of it are reaching the people here in Britain with, through the yeah, refugee crisis. Yeah, that's the crisis. other part of the war, yeah. isn't it? The, the, the attack on our own liberties, the refugee crisis and so on. Well, when the Stop the War Coalition was formed, as well as our main objective being to stop the war, the, then the war in Afghanistan primarily, we also said we have two other objectives, to oppose a racist backlash and to defend civil liberties, because we foresaw that those would become issues that would arise out of the conflict. And that's what uh, uh, has been proved absolutely true. Uh, the refugee crisis now is directly connected to the war, very directly and intimately, and of course it is then used by politicians on the right, and not only on the right, to stimulate a sort of uh, xenophobic, uh, xenophobic feeling. So this war, like, like most wars in the last 100, 150 years, it's not simply a war fought somewhere else with, with no domestic consequences. The sort of um, uh, tendrils of this war reach deep into our own society. Why, though? Are they fools or are they knaves? Are they James Bond or, or Austin Powers? Uh, why have they learned nothing? Why do they keep doing it? Well, my, my analysis, which I think is shared by a lot of people in Stop the War, would say this is uh, a variation on imperialism. It's a neo-imperialism. Of course, people can look at it and look at it from other aspects, but the, the hallmarks of imperialism, neo-colonialism, the drive for hegemony, the drive to secure resources, uh, the drive to order the whole world uh, around the interests of a few great powers, are all very much... Uh, at play. You take any particular conflict, of course there are nuances, there are other aspects and we, we can't say that the peoples of the Middle East and South Asia are simply pawns on a chessboard. Nevertheless, there is uh, uh, imperialism, uh, in my view, uh, which has been set back and defeated from time to time, but is undead, uh, is at the root of it. Now you wrote a novel some years ago now in which you, with great prescience I, I may now add, uh, looked forward, or at least uh, in the direction forward, to a time when an actual superpower conflict could be sparked in one of these hotspots. Syria, Ukraine, maybe both. We're quite close to that now. Well, we are. I mean, that was a book I wrote in the 1990s, Flashpoint World War III. It had a sort of novel introduction and then went into more a non-fictional analysis. And uh, I argued then, really looking ahead, that a war could break out over the Ukraine. Um, I identified the flashpoint as been Lvov in the western Ukraine rather than Donbass in the eastern Ukraine. But, but yes, this logic, because uh, in the 1990s, you'll remember, George, it was a sort of new world order, a world order that's supposed to be peace and uh, uh, all the troubles are supposed to have been ended with the ending of the Soviet Union. And I was then arguing that quite the reverse was true. This would unleash new sorts of conflicts. Uh, and the three broad areas I'd identified then, which didn't take a lot of uh, uh, great skill, but were the Middle East, Eastern Europe, around the Ukraine, and the Far East. And in each of those now, we haven't talked about the Pacific yet, the confrontations between the United States and its allies pushing against China. Uh, these could lead to 
uh, much bigger wars. And if we consider the breakdown, complete breakdown of US-Russian relations over Syria, uh, the tensions in the Ukraine caused primarily by NATO's move eastwards, pushing eastwards, uh, and the, uh, the fact that the United States can't easily accommodate the rise of Chinese power in what is, after all, China's own backyard, uh, all of these... The clue is in the name, South China Sea. <laughs> South China Sea, that is a clue, isn't it? It's not the far West American Sea. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, and all of these, history teaches us that all of these things can lead to wars. And of course, in the past, I mean, I mean in our lifetimes, that normally meant this sort of nuclear standoff between two great powers, and perhaps a war like that remains happily, very unlikely. But some sort of escalation, uh, a dramatic escalation, bringing in big powers uh, into these conflicts, uh, which have uh, either been stirred up or, at worst, uh, exacerbated by US and British intervention, that is a real danger. Well, in Syria, they are, I mean, their airplanes are in the same airspace. Mm -hmm. There are missiles flying through the same air. Uh, Russia has taken the fight to ISIS and Al-Qaeda and the foreign invasion of Syria uh, to the front line. And the United States is increasingly angry about it. It doesn't take much of an accident for an actual clash between these two superpowers well, to take place. Well, not at all. And, I mean, although you and I would have criticisms of President Obama's uh, foreign policy, uh, I fear that whoever is elected well, as the next US indeed. president sure, yeah. will be deterioration. I mean, just um, yesterday or the day before, John McCain, a very senior member of the US Senate, he was arguing for the US to impose a, um, a no-fly zone on Syria, impose a no-fly zone, saying shooting down any Syrian regime planes and making the environment unsafe or hostile for Russian planes. Well, this is a recipe for war. Now, at the moment, I don't imagine President Obama is likely to go down that line. President Clinton, um, Might well. much well, yeah. more likely, and for President Trump, it would be <laughs> unwise to try and anticipate uh, what might uh, uh, happen as long as it doesn't involve a Mexican beauty queen. Uh, <laughs> so, so uh, uh, who, who would want that finger on the trigger? Uh, so, so th th these are real. You might fall over and, and press it. <laughs> yes, indeed. So we're actually in a far more danger. I mean, you and I grew up and indeed uh, took sides. Uh, in, a, in a Cold War environment where we kind of knew, but for the Cuban uh, missile crisis, we kind of knew that it wasn't going to lead to a hot war. Uh, the Soviet Union was led by, by sober and realistic people, and up to a point, so was the United States. I mean, even Nixon. When you think back now, Nixon to Trump, yeah. it's a long yeah. way. Yes. Um, but we are now in this perilous position where either Godzilla 1 wins or Godzilla 2 wins, either the cold, calculating Hillary Clinton or the madman. That's a terrifyingly dangerous prospect. It is. It is, it is more dangerous uh, from that point of view than it's been at any time since the end of the Second World War. I mean, for the reasons you've outlined, a nuclear uh, confrontation between the USA and the Soviet Union, certainly post-Cuba, uh, missile crisis is always unlikely. Now, perhaps because the threshold is lowered somewhat, that no one is in any of these scenarios happily anticipating uh, missiles being fired at uh, Pittsburgh or St. Petersburg, uh, but that th there is still a bubbling level of confrontation of uh, United States power thrashing around, most obviously in the Middle East, but also in other parts of the, uh, of the world, not coping with a reality that the unipolar world they imagined post the Cold War is breaking up. Uh, our objective in the Stop the War has been obviously to bring these arguments to the British people, but also to detach uh, Britain, the British government, the British people from this following the, the uh, United States into one war uh, after another. There's a limit to what we can do about US politics or Russian politics, mm. uh, but we can focus on that and I think stop that's where stop the wars impact has been despite the the Bourbon tendencies you identified uh, there is also evidently a greater reluctance not <laughs> reluctance enough a greater reluctance to plunge headlong into uh, conflicts particularly if they 
uh, involve uh, boots on the ground. Now, I not, can't be complacent about that. There's no. British troops being moved into yeah. the Baltic secret. and so Without on. Us secret it's boots. Uh, and uh, secret on boots on the ground yeah. in Syria, yeah. for sure. Not, not very secret. Well, the all. best of luck with the conference. Sorry, I can't be there. Best of luck to the Stop the War Coalition. Thank you very much. And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? So on the war on drugs, a Euroman and activist says the so-called war on drugs was another invention by the USA to keep the military complex spending high. And on the war on terror, Ricardo Picasso says we have learned what Stop the War already knew. Going around bombing people solves nothing. And maybe future governments will have learned that when two million people protest, listen to them. Well, as Einstein said, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is the very definition of madness. Madness, indeed. Well, that's all we have for today. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. But you can stay in touch with us on social media, on Twitter at RT underscore Sputnik or on Facebook, Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous. <laughs>